Good morning, everyone. This reading is so utterly beautiful. It's just so subtle. Um, Certainly the Bible and Gita readings, but Swamiji's words, the way he speaks about wind and sound, and even when I was just listening to this song, all the music was beautiful this morning, but the master's love for me. And there's a line that says, so sweet the sound of Om, its master's voice I hear. In all pervading silence, he whispers, I am near. And it feels, it's not if we think it through, but at first listening, it sounds like such a contradiction. Wait a minute, it's all pervading silence. How's he whispering? But you just realize how beautiful, uh, how deeply attuned to truth uh, someone had to be to write that song, to know that when we hear the sound of Om, we're hearing the Master. We've gotten all of the other sounds of the universe that we're always listening to out of the way, and we're just hearing God speak with us. Um, Because of the subtlety of the reading, it's at first a little challenging to think about, how am I going to speak about this? Because everything feels so gross in comparison uh, to the reading itself, and everything feels so beyond mind. So it, it, it took some time to even find a thread, but let me start by sharing a couple of stories. Yesterday, we went on a hike. I think some of you have seen pictures of that little hike over here in Arastradero. It was not a hard hike. It was listed as moderate, but it turned out, I think, to be pretty easy for most of us, about five miles. And there was a new person who joined us. I don't think any of us on the hike had ever met him. Absolutely lovely, sweet soul, right from the beginning. He just felt it. It was a joy to have him join the group. However, (laughs) when we started walking, we realized that he doesn't walk much. So what felt easy, there's still a 600-foot gain. That's not huge, but it's 600 feet. Um, And it was very, I don't know if it was hard for him or not, but he was walking uh, something like this. So suddenly this five-mile walk was going to be taking a lot longer than we thought it would take. But he was very dear. And I had said at the beginning of the hike, because it was listed, hike with Shanti, that I would be responsible for everybody. I would always be at the rear of the whole group. Don't worry, everybody else walk at your own pace. And I did that pretty much most of the way up. I didn't do it totally with grace and ease in my mind because I wanted to go, and I couldn't go. Um, But he was wonderful to talk with. But I realized that he might have even more trouble coming down for a lot of reasons, didn't matter what. And there was a, a woman who was with us, everybody's going to remain nameless here, who... I said a couple of times, everybody just go, I'll stay, I'll make sure I stay back and maybe we can rotate, not me, but the other people who were with him because otherwise if one person stays back with somebody who's very slow, you can tend to be there the whole hike. Maybe it's not what they had in mind. But one of the women who we were hiking with made a decision, went over, took his hand, 
and for the entire rest of the hike up and for the whole hike down, she just held his hand. It was the sweetest thing. It was natural, like she was walking with uh, her beloved father. And I said several times, it was so dear and so tender. It's, it's hard to put it into words, but it was just pure love being manifested. And I knew she could get up this hill way quicker than I could. But she just, and she was so interested in him. He had her full attention. And then all the way down, in the meantime, I knew I was giving service today. I was not prepared to give service today. I also know I'm leaving very early in the morning for a two-week seclusion. Very important. I think I'm going away to get close to God in seclusion. That's what seclusion's for. <laughs> and I'm getting more and more restless and anxious because I don't think I can make it down faster than them. <laughs> so I would do this. I would walk ahead. Then I would turn around and look. Then, I mean, it was so rude. <laughs> I also knew I had to prepare home to leave home for two weeks. There was a lot to do. Finally, at some point, when I knew we still had a way to go, I walked up to them, and he said, am I keeping everybody back? Everybody else had gone ahead. They were out of sight. And I said, oh no, not at all. Everybody's just perfect. But I actually really need to get home. So are you two okay if I leave you? And they were, of course they were. They were totally in a place of love. So when I got home and collected myself and was feeling a little ashamed of myself, I wrote her and I said, I just want you to know I'm so touched by the pure love, the tenderness, everything you were showing him. And she wrote me back and she said, I felt so blessed. I felt like I just had the most beautiful walk with Master and Swamiji. That's what it feels like to me. She said, they're everywhere. It, the sermon for today. <laughs> Only she was giving it, not me. <laughs> Here I was, getting ready to go into seclusion to find God. And there she was experiencing God right in the moment. It was very beautiful. And it was the essence of what this reading and this talk is about. And it is subtle. And in many ways, not just I have so much to do in the rest of the day and I have to get home and I have to be prepared and I have to be anxious so I can run off to meet God. But <laughs> I have to make fun of myself or I couldn't live with myself. It was so embarrassing in, in my mind. But it did remind me of another story that I've told here before, that when Ralph Waldo Emerson started on one of his first walks, I think this was pre-Walden Pond, he said he got out at least an hour on the walk, and he stopped, and he realized that all he had been thinking about were pencils, because unbeknownst to most of us, I, I think, maybe there's a few of you here who knew, he was the one who sort of founded the concept of pencils. Now that was a pretty important and great concept, Maybe not by now. Maybe most people don't use pencils anymore. I still do. But we all sure did at one point. But he stopped himself, and he realized that that's where his mind had been. So he turned around. He went all the way back to the beginning of the walk, 
And he started the walk over. And he said, I'm taking this walk to hear the wind, to look at every leaf, to absorb the fragrances, the sights, the sounds. He was a deeply spiritual man, all of which he knew were the manifestation of God. In some way he knew it, but he got sidetracked by pencils. I got sidetracked by a seclusion. It doesn't matter. It matters. It just shows so clearly what it means to be right in the moment and to find God anywhere, everywhere, wherever we are. You know, it's so easy. It's easier and so beautiful in nature to do this. It gets more difficult away from nature in noisier places, crowded places. We were up in um, Yosemite for a few days, a few days ago. And we were up in Tuolumne, and we hiked up from there. So it was beautiful for those of you who have been there. It's really exquisite. But we walked, we found a place to get down by the Tuolumne River, cross a bridge, and just walk up the other side, just a little bit. It wasn't, it was maybe a 20 minute walk from where we were sleeping. And to go up there, Lakshmi and I, to meditate. And it was beautiful, um, but it was freezing, really freezing in the morning. It was still mostly dark. So we wound up energizing after we meditated. It's not the usual way we do it for those of you who don't know what energization is, but it's a series of exercises that Yogananda brought to us to help us learn how to be aware of energy, that substrate out of which everything in the universe is made, including but not limited to us, but it's a series of exercises, and it's rigorous. So we meditated, and then we energized. And I said to myself, now having meditated, which was perfect, and I never, I never do this, but I said, what if you don't energize? You don't energize. What if you just allow it to happen through you? That was the thought that came. And that was, so it's a series of 39 exercises. Now, I've been doing them for 40 years, so I don't usually have to think much, but every once in a while I find myself saying, oh, wait a minute, I forgot this or that, and coming back to it. And so the, the mind is a little more engaged than we might want it to be. But in that moment, I had consciously put my mind aside, and I had the most beautiful, really, for me, extraordinary experience. Now, it was maybe easier to do that because it's the high country in Yosemite, and you really do hear the little white water from the river, and you actually hear the wind coming through the trees, all of these beautiful, natural sounds. But the experience that I had is that the energization happened through me. The energy flowed through me into all of these little crevices of my being till I could feel, I wasn't thinking this, but it, it happened, I am energy. As it went on, I was no longer listening to the river or even the wind or certainly not noticing the trees. It was one of those, I would say for me, unusual moments in life where I was experiencing a oneness. It was so exquisite, so otherworldly, because when we can get there, we become 
part of, we realize, I would say, that we are one with everything. But it's an experience that we're having. It's not a thought that we're trying to get to. And it's exquisite. This is where these masters and avatars and people far more highly evolved than I am live. They live knowing that or at least touching into it more often. I think it's what was happening for this great soul, this beautiful soul on the hike. And she just knew that's where she was, exactly where she needed to be. There was no other. And she realized, I don't mean in her mind, but actually experienced the perfection of it. All of this life, all of the goal for those of us who are on this path, when we hear this line that comes through the Gita reading today, God is not provable. It means get out of your head. Don't try and do it from there. This is very challenging. It's extremely challenging. Swamiji himself says over and over, I was just listening to a wonderful talk that he gave, where he said, of course God made it hard. And we all know, we've all heard the story, first God didn't make it hard. He manifested all of this, but we all remembered the beauty and joy of being that, so we just folded back into the divine. So here we are now, forgetting We've forgotten, and Swamiji says in a talk, that which many of us know. Of course, as soon as we take human form, as soon as there is an ego, which is the soul identified with the body, everything becomes a thought. And in those thoughts, everything is separate. It's just the nature of it. So it's very hard for us to get out of those thoughts back into the remembrance of truth, the only truth. We never are separate. We never were separate. We never will be. But there's this illusion and delusion going on that keeps us out there. We actually think that which is unchangeable changes. We actually think that which is timeless takes place here and there and, 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 and can separate itself. It does not. It exists through all of us at the same moment, the same time, in everyone and everything. There is no other. But Swamiji says, yes, God made it very hard to get back to that place of knowing that. He said, but when you get there, it is so much sweeter than it would be if you didn't have to work for it. And he, um, he tells, he, 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 cre he creates the image, which he's done in many different times, but it was just in this talk again. Um, it's funny, that image, just, oh, of a movie. He says this. He said, what if somebody sent you to a movie? And in the movie, there was a beautiful girl who was from a rich family, lived in a gorgeous home, had everything she wants. Those of you who know this story, you're shaking your head, yes. But it's such a perfect example, the way Swami Kriyananda would do it. Then she meets the perfect man in this story who has as much money as her family does, lives in just a beautiful home, just as beautiful home. They get married. They have two or three children. He says, how many of you would stay for the end of the movie? It's boring. <laughs> this is what she said. And it's true. He said, but you spice it up with a little bit of the underdog having to work hard, and it's, you know the maid who fell in love with the master of the house, and they fight their way. He said, it has your attention when you have to work hard for those things that are not obvious. It's so sweet when, when, you, when you get it. 
So he said, of course, uh, it's, it's hard, but that is what we need to do. Because with ego, with that labyrinth that takes us through all of our desires, our attractions, our perceived needs, with all of that comes separation. And we live separate. And we can't find that place of this joy, that moment, taking the perfect walk, having the perfect opportunity, and remembering to energize in a certain way. Swamiji says, if we could all find that point of intuitive perception, he quotes Master, as we all often do, from the autobiography, because it's so graphic. It's one of those moments where Master says, I cognize the center of all that is at that point of intuitive perception in my own heart. You can, you can sort of get it. If you don't get it, you get very close to getting it. Ah, that's where it is. That's where I need to go. All I need to be doing is deepening my attunement, finding that place where God resides. Exactly what happened at the moment of conception, that spark of the divine, that's where it is. And Swamiji says, if we could find our way back there, everything could evolve so beautifully from there. He had a very wonderful um, image that I'd like to share, because it really grabbed me. We always talk about the gas burner. The pilot light is here, not here, there, but here for right now, representing the divine, representing all that is. Then if you've seen a gas burner, it comes out into all of these little flames, however many there are. And those separate flames represent everything that we perceive as being separate. And we always think if we could just get back and remember the pilot light, that's how we find our way home. What Swamiji said in this talk, he said, if we could turn around and just look at the pilot light, instead of looking out, we turned around and we looked at the pilot light that we would all be saying, oh, that's me, there I am, I'm that source. And it was just such a beautiful image to me, much better than the way I've spoken about it before. That's where we need to get back to. That's the work that we have to do. And we do it. You know, on this hike yesterday we were up, was a beautiful view at the top of the hike, which is why we chose this hike as opposed to several others. Just because the, the, uh, we wanted to get to some, arrive somewhere that had a, um, a beautiful view. Then we sat down and we chanted and we meditated. And there was nothing, no distraction, no noise, but us, almost no distraction. We were sitting on the ground and there were a few little things biting into our skin and stuff, but <laughs> meditate on it, meditate on it. But other than all of what was natural. But this is what we do. We just keep taking ourselves back to these places where we can remember, back to these places where we can tell ourselves, now is the moment, now I can go there. Now, if we could ask this question all the time, the question is, how? And we've been given all of the tools. Every chant that was sung this morning, every chant was a chant that came to mind last night. It was perfect. I mean, not surprising, but, oh, God, beautiful. You know, there you are in the forest, in the rivers, everywhere. 
and now I can't remember the second one, but it was, and then reveal thy, thyself, but there was another chant, whatever it was. Beautiful, perfect chants. We chant them, and we chant them. Well, sit down and chant that chant for an hour. Chant it for an hour. That beautiful reading from Whispers this morning that Steve read. When I was packing for my seclusion, I put Whispers in the bag to go with me, telling myself I have to find that whisper. But all of them, really, they're just so beautiful. Be ready for an experience. I'll close with one more story um, that I imagine many of you have heard. Um, Bharat, who many people here know, he's a naturalist. He, from the stories he tells, it sounds like he was really awake at a very uh, young age. And he was a Boy Scout when he was young. In fact, he was whatever it's called when you're in charge of a certain part of the Boy Scouts. I don't know what level that is, but he, he was that. And he said he went into this trip of his, a Boy Scout trip, asking God to show him what next? How will I serve next? What will I do next? So he goes to this camp. He's helping to run the camp. One day he goes off for a walk by himself. And he's sitting at a lake. And he sees one of the scouts walking around the lake, coming towards him. And he's watching him come. And the scout hands him a letter and says, they asked me to bring this to you at the camp. They asked me to bring this to you. So this letter had been delivered to his mother's home in the Midwest somewhere. He was not in the Midwest. His mother just decided it was addressed to him. I'll send it to the, where the scout's council is. She sends it there. They decide to send it to... Um, the place, the camp where the Boy Scouts are meeting. Whoever got it there, this moment, this day, decides to have somebody carry it out to Barat. He opens the letter, and it's an announcement, a uh, pub publicity piece for Ananda. It's a publicity piece that has now made itself halfway around the country. You know, God is in everything. God is everywhere. God, real, that is the most, un, I thought I had miracles in my life. I do, I have had some miracles. Can you imagine? That is such an unlikely story if we're trying to be rational. God cannot be proved. He can't be, except in our hearts, except when we open to the miracle of something like that. This little, it was a throwaway. If his mother wasn't being guided by Master and Swamiji, it's a throwaway. Then the next person, the next person, all the way to him. This is what God wants for us. God wants us to really be able to dive so deep, to keep bringing ourselves back to this place, not of the mind, not to be the smartest, but to be the most open-hearted. This is the heart chakra we're talking about, but it does inform the heart. To be able, we don't have to get stupid in the process, but all the, all the smarts in the world, again, I just, I've been studying Sri Yukteswar's book, The Holy Science, so it's very present for me. That wisdom that's been informed by the heart is where every possibility of knowing God is.
Oh